So if I didn't uh, thank individually everyone who's here for not only being here, but for being in the study, I'll be here at the end of our little presentation. And please come and introduce yourself. But this is really about you. This is us telling you how influential you are at science, uh, how much we progressed thanks to the studies that you're participating. And um, I, I, I also want to say that, uh, and we talked about it with some of you before, it was two tough weeks for Jews in the United States. And I know that a lot of you express some stress. And it's good to be together for really an unbelievable um, effort that is only Jewish. And it looks at tikkun olam, at repairing the world. And we want to show you how much we're doing and how much we're on the road there, not in a political way, but in a scientific way. And so I really appreciate all of you uh, coming here. And what we'll do is we'll give you several short presentations telling you where we are. And most important, where the three of us will sit up here and let you ask us questions. And, uh, and uh, we'll, see, um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the, party, the party will continue. The food is still outside. So we want you to be happy. Uh, there's more food than drinks because we're Jewish. So it's all OK. Um, so I want to start by showing you this figure. And in this figure, you see the relationship between death from several age-related diseases that are here and age. And there are many lines here, so let me take you through one line first. Let's look at heart disease, which is in blue here. And you see that the risk of dying from heart disease between age 20 and age 85 goes from 5 to about 5,000. Now, did you know that aging is such a big risk for heart disease? I mean, you know that cholesterol is risk for heart disease, but you know that cholesterol is a threefold risk for heart disease. And aging is a 5,000-fold risk for heart disease. Now, that's not all. If you look at the second line that is cancer, and by the way, this is a log, okay, a log scale. So you see the number go from 10,000. So that's why it's 5 to 5,000. And you see that cancer is the same. It goes from about 8 to about 1,200. Aging is the major risk for cancer. So, and, and so is diabetes here in the orange line, and also Alzheimer, all those age-related diseases. The major risk is aging. Now, why is it important? Because aging has a biology. We all know that. We all know who's older and who's younger. We don't know to divide you guys by who have hypertension or, or have high, high cholesterol. But we know that we recognize people who are getting older. What we don't know, ma the majority of us, is aging can be actually targeted. And we've done it many times in the lab. We can delay aging. We can prevent aging. Sometimes we can reverse parts of aging. And so we're trying to figure out what is in aging that we can target. So the major risk for any disease is aging. So if we cure one disease, Let's say, let's think about somebody who gets a heart attack. 
and he goes into the emergency room with heart attack. And he gets a, a, a stent or goes through coronary bypass. We treated the heart, right, specifically. We didn't treat the aging, which is the major risk. What happens to those people when within two, three years, they're starting to developing diabetes and cancer and Alzheimer's because we didn't do the aging, we did only the heart. So if we replace one disease, if, if we cure one disease, we're going to replace it with another. And that doesn't make sense. We want to really impact aging. We want to stop aging and by that prevent a disease. That's what our uh, studies, what, that is what the center here at Einstein is, is all about. Now, you might say, but just a minute, we know that there's genetics for heart disease and there's genetic for cancers, and that's true. Which disease you're going to get first depends on your genetics and your environment. If your mother had diabetes, and you're obese, you're probably going to get diabetes first, okay? But it doesn't matter because the next, because aging will continue and you'll get the next disease. Another important thing to note is that, bi that chronological age and biological age are not the same. And I think this audience here is typical. I think you look at the people your age, and a lot of you know that you look better than them, that your biology is better than them. So of course, people who age quicker, they get diseases quicker. They get the first disease and second disease and third disease. Uh, uh, and so if we could change the biology for those people, then we'll make something good happen. What are the evidence that we actually can delay aging? And I'll tell you those two sentences. Healthy, healthy lifespan, not only longevity, but being healthy for a long period of time has been done in many animals, in worms and flies and mice and rats and monkeys. And we've done it by a variety of ways. We can do it by genetic manipulation, but manipulation with the environment and by drugs. And some of those drugs are actually in use in human, but they're not used to target aging. But we can take you to our labs and show you mice that are living 10%, 15%, sometimes 24% longer because we know how to target aging. So this brings us to this study, okay? And this study started 20 years ago when we said, you know, one of the things that happened in aging research is we started creating animals that live longer. So let's look at people who live longer. Let's look at centenarians. Because life expectancy, when centenarians were at that age, was about 70, 75 years. So they lived 25, 30 years longer than other people. That's a huge percent of longevity. What is so special about them? But it's not only, um, it's, on, it's, it's not, so, so you're thinking what can, what can we do because if we take centenarians, what's our control, right? We need, I, we, the centenarian made it. But the people who went with them to school, to college, they died. So we're not going to their graves, right, to find out what happened to them. So how we create a study that has a control. And one of the things uh, uh, we know is that their families, their children, uh, their siblings, they also live longer. 
And that also gives us a clue that there is genetic here that we should pursue. So how do we get a control to our study? Well, what we decided to do is we decided to take the centenarians and to take their offspring, okay, their children, and, and the people who are married to their children or other people who don't have longevity in their families. So for a genetic purpose, we have unrelated people, some of them, are younger people that don't have longevity, and then we have our centenarians. Now, not only we've done that, we said, how can we really get lucky and find the genetics really fast without recruiting too many people? And the answer was, we should go and look at the Ashkenazi Jews. So let me explain why do we look at the Ashkenazi Jews. And it's not because Jewish people live longer or shorter in any way. In fact, we're assuming they do not. The reason is best explained if I'll tell you something um, about Iceland. In Iceland, there are 400,000 people. And those 400,000 people are all children, several generation, of five Vikings and four Irish women. They are brothers, cousins. Now, what does it mean? If some of them have diabetes and some do not have diabetes, their genetic makeup is quite similar to each other. They're like a big family with little noise. So those that have diabetes will become more apparent when we do genetic testing than if we go in New York City and take all the colors and the diversity. It will be lots of noise for us. It's the same for why we're doing the Ashkenazi Jews, that it's for our unfortunate past and the way our genetic, our isolation, uh, all the crisis that we had and, and, and uh, decreasing our numbers at several times in history made us more alike than other European people. And in some ways, it's always gene specific, but sometimes it's 50 to 100 people less than if we had to go all over the world and find people like that. So it's really a main shortcut. And there's another interesting thing about the Jewish population, and that is we're more homogeneous from an education and socioeconomy point of view, which is a major reason for healthcare disparity in the United States in particular. So there's a lot of advantage in coming to the Ashkenazi Jews, and that's the reason. It's very scientific. So let me tell you about some of, of the challenges. So when we went to our IRB, that's the review board that approves human projects, and we gave them our protocol, and we said, we're, we, we wrote a note, we're going to study of uh, centenarians and their children. The next day, the package was back on my desk with a note, for children, you need other forms. <laughs> well, the children of centenarians are 80 years old, you know? We don't need other forms, okay? But those were some of the things, you know, the IRB didn't understand, you, you're all, everybody was aware of genetic diseases and people are secretive about genetic diseases, about those bad genes. But we were looking for good genes, and people didn't know how to react to that. You know, and they told us, well, you're going to find something, you should, you should give genetic counseling to those people. And I said, well, explain to me how it, it goes. I have a 100-year-old, I find a longevity gene, what is the genetic counseling going to tell him? That he's going to live long? 
and, and, and he really needed a counseling 30 years ago, but not genetic, but business counseling, right? Because they didn't know they're going to live so long and who knows what resources they have. Another thing, we were, we we're going to the centenarian's house and we had a, at one point a nurse, Bill Greiner, I don't know if anybody knew him here, he is not Jewish, and he was working in an intensive care unit before, but he got frustrated because, because he never talked with the patients. <laughs> and he said, I really want to work in a project where I can talk with people, and he just enjoyed his work so much. But I ran into some of the people or came to visit after him, and they said, you know, Bill was really, really a nice guy, but, you know, I woke up early, I made a cake, and I offered him a cake, and he didn't want to take the cake. <laughs> and it repeated itself, and I said, Bill, why don't you take a cake? He said, because I ate already. <laughs> I said, well, tell them that you ate, and you'll take the cake in a napkin and have it later, and you can throw it away, but come on, we're Jewish, it's important for us, this food stuff. <laughs> um, For a lot of you, uh, and you might not remember, we did a, an interview with you in the phone before we invited you. And the interview was to determine if cognitively you can be in our study. And so if you remember, we said to you in the beginning of the call, we're going to uh, ask you to repeat three things that we're telling you to repeat, and we're going to ask you at the end of the phone, the phone to repeat them again. And one of the guys came to me and said, you know, when they said that, I was at home, I took a piece of paper and I wrote those three things down. <laughs> so I, I, asked, I asked Wanda how, how much it happens. She said, it happens all the time. <laughs> That's okay, that means that cognitively you know what you're doing. <laughs> if you thought you're cheating, it's fine. <laughs> How many of you remember that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this is what we'd like to have. You know, our life expectancy in the United States is about 80 years. And here in Brown, the last five eight years, we started to get disease. We get one disease and another disease and third disease and there are treatments and the treatments have side effects and interactions. And so what we'd like to do is to extend the health span. Maybe the lifespan too. But this is something that would be nice. We wouldn't even mind just to extend the health span. You die whenever you die, but you're never sick for a day in your life. The one thing we don't want to do is extend only the life without the health. So how are we doing with that? So we looked at the centenarians, and we looked at our control, and we looked at the times they're getting diseases. So you see our controls started to get sick at about age 60, and by the age of 80, 90% of them with any, any one of those diseases. In centenarians, they started to get the diseases much later, and at age 100, 30% didn't have a disease even. They lived 20, 30 years healthier, not only longer. And actually, that's not what the striking thing. The striking thing was that they were sick less at the end of their lives. There was what we call a contraction of morbidity. Okay, so they're healthy, 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 and then they die, or they're sick for a very short time. It's interesting that at the same time, the Center of Disease Control had looked at the medical cost in the last two years of life of somebody who dies at age 70 and somebody who dies at age, after the age 100. 
And the medical cost in the last two years of life is third in those that die after the age of 100. So it all fits together. If we extend the health span, we also decrease the health cost. And there's a longevity dividend. We calculate this longevity dividend even if we extend health span by two, three years, it's a $7 trillion saving in the economy. We cannot afford not to do that, okay? Um, so let, let me tell you about the centenarians. I should, I should pause for a second. I'm, I'm the first speaker. Sophia Milman is going to talk about, I'm talking about the centenarians more, if you notice. Sophia will talk more about what the study that you're participating that's very, uh, integral to that. And then uh, Anna will talk, and some of you know Anna, she's a cardiologist, and she'll talk about one of the efforts we're doing in, uh, in uh, imaging uh, the city of the coronary. So uh, I'm sorry, I should have said it up ahead, but uh, there, there's more to come. So let me introduce you to the Khan family, and, and first of all, introduce you to Tom, who's sitting right here. You know, Tom uh, and his family are the poster childs of, my, of, of our study, and I'll tell you what. But Tom is like, if you were a union, he would be your representative. He's like on your case all the time. What are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Why are you torturing them here? Why are you torturing them? He takes care of you. He also contributed to our uh, study and to its success. So this is Tom Kahn, and I'll tell you something about his family. This is his father and the two sisters, so his two aunts and another brother in a picture that was taken around 1920. So there are four siblings born to two, to two parents between 1910 and 1920. And this is a picture that was taken about 90 years later. And the important thing that all those guys passed the age of 102. Uh, his aunt told me she was shocked when the little sister died at 102. She couldn't believe it. So she lived to be 110, 109, and 107. What are the chances that four siblings in New York are getting to be so old? What I want to show you now is a little movie that was done several years ago when, they were, when Tom's father was um, almost, almost 105. And what I want you to notice mainly is that how life is good when you're healthy. In this office building on Madison Avenue, New York City, 104-year-old investment advisor Irving Kahn is working hard, as he has since his career on Wall Street began in 1928. He shares his secret to a long and healthy life. To wake up in the morning and have something to look forward to. Irving's curiosity and keen business sense have led him to become a widely respected value investor, a member of the New York Stock Exchange, and chairman of Kahn Brothers, the company he founded more than 30 years ago with two of his sons, including Thomas, who is the president. Irving works five days a week with his 67-year-old son and 29-year-old grandson, Andrew. And how are you going to link the underwriting projects? Playing an integral part in managing over $700 million in assets. Irving's first business venture was as a boy selling newspaper subscriptions for a nickel so that he could buy a bicycle. He recalls how his father taught him to ride. We lived on 106th Street. It was a wide street here up right ahead. And he said, sit on the street and hold on a handlebars. And it gave me a push. But here I was out in the middle of the street, still not falling. What could I do? I, so I learned how to ride very quickly. He taught me how to swim as well. He pushed me in the water. He said, would you rather drown or rather swim? Irving says those were the first steps in learning how to do things for himself. 
Show me the paper. <laughs> Thomas believes his father's thirst for knowledge fuels his drive. Work is his life. So he's always been a absorber of information. Ever since I was a child, he would bring home annual reports and read them at the dinner table. He was, and that's what he still does. This is the Aztec website. And Irving says not working is unthinkable. Well, I would pay you if you took it away from me. I, I try to buy it back. He believes mental challenge is key. The important thing is to keep that brain going, you see. 20.8%. To stay sharp, Irving reads materials online, two financial newspapers daily, and a wide range of nonfiction. I read a lot of science. I read no fiction, no mystery stories, and no sex novels. So that leaves a lot of time for science. And it was Irving's interest in science that led him to participate in the Longevity Genes Project at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, led by researcher Nir Barzilai. Nir and his team have recruited more than 500 healthy elderly, ages 95 to 112, and their children. Irving and Thomas are part of the study, as is Irving's big sister. Muskets, 108-year-old Helen Reichert, a former television host and fashion historian. She recently had a stroke, but is otherwise in excellent health. So far, Nir and his team have found several gene variants that are more common in this group and protect against cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's. And so on and so on. So I, I hope you were impressed. This is an 105 years old that will buy, will buy back his business if you take it away, um, even if he reads no sex novels. So what are we finding? Well, we are finding longevity genes. What does it mean, longevity genes? It's not that those people have genes that the rest of us don't have, but they have mutations. They have changes on those genes that make them either active or inactive, and they are in the middle of the pathways for aging. What you see here is several of those uh, mutations where we take unrelated people. So you know everybody pretty much dies between 55 to 105. But if you're surviving and you have more of those mutation, you assume that those mutations were important in bringing you here. And I'm not going to talk much about those mutations, but to say really two things. Two of the mutations that we studied have been used by drug company as information on safety and efficacy. They developed drugs because, or, or thanks a lot to our findings, and those drugs are after phase three trial and will be available probably soon. They didn't develop it for aging. They developed it against cardiovascular disease. But once they're available, we'll check if they are also good, not only against cardiovascular disease, but, uh, but against other uh, things that are associated with aging. So uh, Merck developed an inhibitor against the CTP gene, and Ionis developed a, a, an antisense against APOS-C3. By the way, when Ionis came to us, their name was ISIS. So they changed the name, now they're Ionis and the drug is actually working well. <laughs> the, the other thing is the TSH. TSH is really how you measure if your thyroid is hypoactive. And we found that the centenarians and their children have a little bit high TSH. They're not hypothyroid, but their TSH was a little high. And we thought that maybe this thing decreases metabolism a little bit, and maybe this decrease in metabolism helps them to live longer. What our study has done, it's led to a validation in another study, 
And then the American Thyroid Association came up with instructions of not giving thyroid hormone to elderly who have just a little bit high TSH, because if this is a mechanism that is important, we, want, we don't want to ruin that. So if anybody comes and say, you know, your TSH is a little bit high, watch it, call us, <laughs> okay? Because there is an indication not to give. So those three examples are part, not all, of some of our findings, and uh, Sophia will go uh, uh, to other findings too. But I want to tell you really a cute story. In nature, the small lives longer, right? The small dogs live longer than the large dogs. And the ponies live longer than the thoroughbreds. And in the lab, if you, ta if you do dwarf mice or you give them growth hormones, if they have more growth hormone, they live shorter. If they have less growth hormone, they live, they live longer. And those dwarf mice that are spontaneous sometimes and they have lots of defects, they live much longer and much healthier. So this is in nature and we wondered, is this also important in humans? And I'm not going to tell you through the genetics, but tell you that we found mutations in some of those growth hormones. Um, it's interesting that after we found these mutations in the growth hormone, there was a paper on Laron dwarfs. Laron dwarfs are actually from a Spanish Jewish origins that, go, that went to Ecuador. And they had mutation in the receptor for growth hormone. And they are dwarf, but they came into attention because although they are dwarf, they have no diabetes and no cancers. They are protected from several of the age-related diseases. So we had our centenarians, we have the dwarf, and then we found uh, just recently, if you, it was in the New York Times, was covered in the New York Times, we found another mutation also in the growth hormone receptor, and it was the coolest thing because it was the people with this mutation were taller, although their growth hormone was lower, and we kind of described the mechanism. Uh, when they are in puberty, and they have high growth hormone, it's actually more active, but for the rest of their life, it's less active. So it was a cool scientific discovery. But mainly, when we find all those mutations, and I didn't talk about everyone, almost over 50% of our centenarians have something wrong with the action of growth hormone. And so we went to Amgen, and Amgen developed a drug that is antagonistic to one of the growth hormone. And we did a study that was published just recently in Nature, where we gave late in life this antibody against the receptor of growth hormone. And what you see in red is the mice that got those uh, antibodies lived substantially longer. You know, they died later, they were healthier for a longer period of life. So this is just some uh, taste of what we are finding and how we know that the centenarians are unique. And we'll go and explain why you are here, because you carry some of the mutations, or maybe half of them, and we want to see how it affects you. I want to finish by uh, asking you, tell me the ages here. Tell me the ages of those people. When did they die? Anyone who knows any number, tell me. Moses? 120. Methuselah? There you go. OK? So first of all, it looks that uh, like after the flood, longevity genes drowned, right? <laughs> There is an interaction with the environment. And those people lived a long time. So when, we, when I went to really orthodox people who believe everything that's written in the Bible, and I said, what about those ages? They said, ah, yeah, they didn't know how to count, OK? And then we discovered something really interesting, and we published that. We showed that our centenarians have, a, have less offspring 
than the appropriate control. Well, what does it mean? And there's an exchange between reproduction and longevity in nature. You can exchange. Um, so what does it mean? It means that if, there's less, if there are less children for the people with centenarians, then there are less and less longevity genes all the time. But that means also that we lost a lot of longevity genes, so maybe those people did live so long. OK? We, we don't know. For me, I can argue back against the orthodox and say, no, they lived that long. We're just losing the longevity genes because with longevity, we don't do the same reproduction. So it's not good for evolution. OK, just, to, just for you to think, to think about it. Um, I really want to uh, tell you we're, we're, we're going all over the world. Our, our study is interesting for everyone. But I want to tell you about this event that was really so special uh, I, I was asked to come to the Vatican. And, and I'm, I'm actually, it's not the first time. I've been in the Vatican several uh, times. Uh, uh, the, the Vatican is like, so two things about the Vatican. First of all, they don't want to be in a Galileo Galilei situation again, right? They don't want science to be so, so obviously against what they're teaching, right? If the sun goes here or there, OK? Um, they also love their Jewish brethren, OK? And Cardinal Ravasi was number four in the hierarchy. is like one of my best friends, OK? He, 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 knows, he speaks Hebrew. We talk forever. And so I get this phone from the Vatican saying the pope is really interested in enhancing therapy as, you know, how do we get therapy out to the poor, to all over the world, and can you come and talk about aging? And I said, yeah, sure. So am I, am I the keynote speaker? And they said, no, the keynote speakers are the Pope and Joe Biden. <laughs> so OK, I'll, I'll come anyhow. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, I, I'm here, I don't have a, a better picture, but that, that was in where uh, the cardinals are meeting or before they go to the Sistine Chapel. Um, and it was interesting that in this, uh, I was with Cardinal Ravosi in the Sistine Chapel. They closed the Vatican and they took us and, and had a party there. And we're sitting under, you know, the famous God touching men, right? And Cardinal Ravasi says, so what do you think about it? I said, you know, this is Jewish belief, not Christian belief. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's when God touched Adam that, that he gets life. In, in Judaism, somebody is alive when he has the first breath out of his nose. It's very specific. Neshama be'apo, OK? In Christianity, it was mistranslated, and life begins in conception. They mistranslated the Bible. He said, no, that's not. I said, you should, you should check it. And he came back the next day, and he said, I just couldn't believe that. I, I didn't know that. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, if you noticed, um, some, some of it, um, yeah. One, one of the supporters were for stem cell. Can you imagine any uh, Orthodox Christian organization in the United States that will let you talk about stem cells? <laughs> in the Vatican, they would listen to that. OK? So ju just a taste, your study is going with me all over the world. And you're the real heroes uh, behind that. So oh, by the way, that was Cardinal uh, Ravasi. I really wanted to thank, uh, um, to thank you again. But in particular, I want to invite Debbie Trock here. Please, come here. <laughs> Debbie, Debbie Trock is just an unbelievable woman. Even her husband there agrees. <laughs> she has an unbelievable amount of energy. She is multitasking like crazy. 
And her role is to find all those centenarians everywhere, go to them, suck their blood, <laughs> and bring it to us. And I, I cannot tell you what's going on in her life and family, and she's volunteering in 1,000 other places. Dorot is here, am I right? <laughs> She has a, a volunteering impact that is absolutely unbelievable. And now that we're uh, done with the centenarian effort, Debbie, I want to uh, th thank you with a, a little um, acknowledgement. Uh, let me open. And it says, presented to Deborah Trock in recognition, dedication service to the longevity studies at the Institute of Aging Research, November 7, 2018. Such a great job. No, thank you. A magician. And I want to invite now uh, Sophia Milman, who's a uh, who was trained by me, but now I'm trained by her. She is so knowledgeable, uh, so much ahead of everything, and she's really running, and she's the next generation who takes over and run uh, those studies, because you're going to continue live forever. I'm almost done. <laughs> Sophia. Well, I'll so thank you all so much for being here. It is really a pleasure to see you all here today. And obviously, this couldn't happen without all of your efforts and dedication. So thank you. And thank you, Nir, for doing a great job um, in introducing what aging is, what aging research is all about, what our goals are, uh, and why we do what we do and why we're studying what we're studying. So Nir did a fantastic job introducing the centenarians, and I will tell you a little bit about longevity or the study that you're in uh, so that you can appreciate, although I'm sure you already do, um, why it is so important uh, to do what you're all doing. So why do we need longevity, right? Nir told you there were great discoveries that were made in centenarians, why bother with an additional study where we bring you in every year and put you through this battery of tests? Why do we need this study? Well, there are several reasons, and I hope that I'll convince you that it is really important and you'll continue participating. So first of all, when we measure things in centenarians, there's a real conundrum. Are we measuring a factor of vitality or a factor of mortality? Let me explain to you what I mean. So centenarians are fantastic, right? They have this extended lifespan and they're healthy, but we're coming to them at the end of that lifespan. So maybe they have another one, five, 10 years to live, but they're towards the end of their lifespan. So if I'm measuring some protein, let's say, in their blood, how do I know that that is actually a marker that got them to this point in life, if that's what actually allowed them to become a centenarian, versus it's a predictor of the mortality that's about to come in a few years. So that's one thing that we can't always figure out just from centenarians. And I'll explain to you how you all come into the picture. So the second is, how did centenarians become centenarians, right? So again, we meet them when they're already centenarians. They're 100 years old. They're doing well. Well, how did they get there? Did they eat right? Did they exercise? Uh, did they smoke or not smoke? You know, sometimes we can get a history from them, but how good is that history? Do you remember what you ate 50 years ago? So, you know, their memories may not be accurate. Uh, but also, we want to understand the process of aging, the process of the biology. How do you get there? A third reason is, well, what are the predictors of healthy aging and longevity? And that's important for uh, two, two reasons. One is, well, Nir told you about all the wonderful developments that are happening in the field. And so it is very possible that in our lifetime, we may have 
drugs, therapeutics, interventions that may impact aging, that may delay aging. The question for us is going to be, well, A, who do we give it to? Because if there are people who are genetically predisposed to become centenarians and stay healthy, well, why should I treat them with a medication, right? And question two that we are often asked, well, when are you going to treat them? You know, if you even have a drug, well, how are you going to decide when to give it to somebody? Are you going to start at age 80? Are you going to start at age 30? Should we give it from birth? So this is why it's really important to understand the aging process as it happens continuously. And that's what longevity is doing. So we can understand, you know, when is that turning point? When do things change? And if we have an intervention, when can we intervene in those people who may not be as lucky, who may not have the longevity genes that Nir spoke about, uh, and ex expand the benefits of the longevity genes through therapeutics to the rest of us, to the majority of the population. And the last point in, that New York kind of alluded to uh, is the control group, right? He spoke uh, about the challenges in finding an appropriate control group for the centenarians. And we have found creative ways to overcome that. But nonetheless, that's probably not ideal because they grow up in a different environment, they're exposed to different things, they're not from the same birth cohort. So when we have the longevity study, we have individuals who are the children of centenarians and the children of non-centenarians who are exposed to the same things, living in the same environment, and we get to follow them continuously and understand why some people age better and others maybe less well. So I hope I convinced you that what you're doing is worthwhile. So let me show you a few examples of what we have learned uh, and how longevity and having both the offspring and the, of centenarians and the offspring of non-centenarians uh, plays into this. So this is an example of HDL cholesterol, or high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, or as most of us refer to it as the good cholesterol. So the good cholesterol, as the name implies, is good for you, so you want to have a lot of it. And along the y-axis, you see the levels of the good cholesterol. And we're comparing centenarians and controls, and we're looking at females in red and males in blue. And if you look at these two figures, the levels are about the same, right? The centenarians and the controls, although they're different in age, they have approximately similar levels of HDL cholesterol. So if you looked at that, just the, the centenarians and the controls, you may assume that HDL cholesterol is really not important for longevity because both the centenarians and the controls have equal levels. But if you now look at the offspring of centenarians, the children of centenarians, they actually have much higher levels than those controls, although they're the same age. And now this suggests to us that people who have a propensity to age well and age in a healthy kind of way actually start out with a higher HDL cholesterol. And over time, it declines. But it doesn't decline to the same degree as in the general population. So when we're looking at the centenarians, they still have the same levels as the controls, but they started you know, at much higher levels. Had they started at the same levels as the general population, you know, the levels would have been much lower. So this suggests to us that by looking at the offspring, we can understand some of the biological factors that contribute to longevity and healthy aging. And, it, and this is what we've done. We looked at the HDL cholesterol levels. And we find that among healthy people, the HDL is the highest. Among those who have hypertension or high blood pressure, that's the middle bar, the HDL levels are lower. And they're even lower in those with cardiovascular disease or diseases of the heart, stroke, vascular diseases. So this is another indication that HDL may play a role in healthy aging. So another example that demonstrates to us why it's helpful to have both controls and offspring uh, comes from autophagy study. So autophagy in Greek means autophagy, which is self-devouring, right? Kind of eating oneself. 
And it's a process that occurs in the cells by which the cells get rid of the garbage that accumulates in the cells. So as you can imagine, right, in an 80-year-old cell, uh, things may go wrong, proteins may malfunction, you may have uh, proteins that are no longer needed or no longer functional, or even organelles such as mitochondria that are dysfunctional. So what does a cell do with it? If it lets it accumulate, you'll have a lot of buildup of garbage. And you can imagine that will lead to a poorly functional cell and poorly functional organs and systems. So cell has a process called autophagy where it can eat up all the garbage and uh, break it up into pieces that it can then recycle. So this is um, an important process. So if we measure that process in cells of centenarians and controls, it looks similar. So again, you know, the same issue we looked at with HDL cholesterol. So if we look at just these two groups, we might think, oh, it's not important for aging. But if we now bring the offspring, and those are in the center, into the picture, we see that the offspring have much higher function of this autophagy. And so they're much better at clearing out and disposing of garbage from the cells. Um, and so this is another indication. This may be a biological process that's contributing uh, to what we're seeing in healthy aging. So now what about lifestyle, right? This is probably the most common question we get asked. I mean, probably every month we get a call from a reporter, either near or I, and they say, oh, we're writing an article on how to live well and how to become a centenarian. We want to know what you should eat and what you should drink, right, and how you should exercise. So yeah, of course, it's an important question to consider. And so we said, well, you know, obviously there are differences that we're finding in the biology between the offspring of centenarians and the offspring of non-centenarians. So it's worthwhile to look whether they're leading different lifestyles. And that's what we've done. And you've probably, you, you may remember answering very detailed questionnaires about your diet and your exercise history. And here's what we found. Uh, when we look at the rates of obesity, that's uh, represented by BMI, uh, we found no differences between the offspring or the control. Uh, there were no differences in individual percent of people who smoked or people who consumed alcohol or exercised. Um, there was also no difference in education or social strata, and as Nir alluded to this, uh, that's very important uh, because that tells you about access to health care, right? So we found no differences in these socioeconomic or lifestyle factors between our offspring and controls. We then compared their diets uh, and also found no differences in the amount of carbohydrates or protein or fats or vegetables or fruits that they consumed. And if you look at the specific um, dietary components that have been associated with cardiovascular disease, there's also no difference. Um, in consumption between offspring and controls. That being said, uh, we do find that the offspring of centenarians represented by the blue bar have lower uh, prevalence of cardiovascular disease. So the percentage of people who have cardiovascular disease among the offspring of centenarians or the children of centenarians is about 12%. And that's compared to about 20% among the people who are not offspring of centenarians, despite having similar lifestyles, despite uh, eating similar types of foods, really driving home the point that genetics um, play an important role in protection from disease and are probably contributing to longevity. So people who have longevity genes seem to be protected. Now, that being said, there's something really important to consider, because I do not advocate that now you all go and drink and smoke and not exercise. <laughs> because there is a role for lifestyle. Uh, there absolutely is. And that is, and many studies have shown that, that if you have the longevity genes, if you're one of the few lucky people who carries longevity genes, then probably what you eat and what you do doesn't matter so much, because these genes protect you. But if you're like the rest of us, which is the majority of the population, and you do not carry these protective longevity genes, then it does matter what you eat 
and that you not smoke and that you exercise. Because if you do these things and you do lead a healthy lifestyle, then you can uh, protect yourself from disease and can extend the healthy lifespan. And I'll just take the last few minutes to introduce you to some of the new initiatives uh, that were introduced in the longevity study. So one initiative is uh, focused on resilience to Alzheimer's disease. Now, you probably all know that Alzheimer's is a quite devastating disease, right? It robs people not only of their memories, but also of the pleasures of interacting with their families and their environment. Uh, but there are people who are resilient to it, meaning they don't get it. And as Nir said, age, right? Age is the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So as people get older, they get it. But our centenarians are quite old chronologically, right? But the, many of, most of them, in fact, don't get it, don't get Alzheimer's disease. And some of them even carry genes that are high-risk Alzheimer's genes, but don't get Alzheimer's. It's pretty fascinating. So we want to kind of tap into that and understand, you know, what is it about them that allows them to live long and yet not develop Alzheimer's? So that's the goal is, you know, understand what genes protect from Alzheimer's disease. And so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that with your help. So you've already been helping us answer some of these questions. So one is you go through this very thorough uh, cognitive testing every time you come and visit us, right? So we're using that information to see how people's cognition changes over time and how we can pair that up with genes and understand what genes uh, contribute to that. Uh, we also have a $6.3 million grant from the NIH uh, that allows us to run the study. And with that money, we were able to initiate magnetic resonance imaging, right, or MRI imaging of the brain. And some of you may have already had these scans done. And so our goal is to pair up this um, knowledge of memory testing with the genetic knowledge, uh, with um, brain imaging knowledge to understand what protects from Alzheimer's, how can we identify it uh, early, and uh, you know, perhaps even intervene in the future. And the second is a brand new initiative which you have not heard of before, but we're planning to roll it out within the next few months. And it will be called the Lifelong Study. And it's really an offshoot of the Longenity Study. And this is going to focus on a younger healthy comparison group. And because we want to understand the biological changes that occur with aging over time. So now the Longenity Study begins at the age of 65. Um, and we get to learn a lot between 65 and, you know, 120. But we want to know what happens before 65. Uh, because things, or aging, I guess, really starts before 65, right? It may start at the time we were born, or it may even start in conception. There are a lot of studies that suggest that we begin aging, uh, you know, at the time of conception. So we want to understand how the biology changes, how we can pick up on these things early on. And again, goes back to, well, if we're going to intervene, at what point in life? And so we're planning to recruit the children and grandchildren of the longevity participants. So that would be your grandchildren and children. Uh, so encourage them to participate um, between the ages of 20 and 59. Uh, we, we want a healthy group, so we have a good comparison group. And it will be a one-time visit. We're going to start with a just one-time visit. We'll probably take about an hour to an hour and a half. We don't want to overburden the young individuals. We know they're working and they're busy. Uh, and over time, we may extend it to a, into a follow-up study. So with that, again, I really want to thank all of you and your families uh, for coming today and for participating for your dedication. Uh, we're going to. We have a great uh, longevity genes project and longevity study team who is here and who all of you know and interact with on an annual basis. And they really deserve um, our appreciation because they really do a phenomenal job. <laughs> and of course, we have many collaborators and colleagues and students and funders who contribute to our research. 
Um, but the last and not least, there's one person who I want to um, mention specifically, and you all know her. Uh, you all interact with her, and you probably think of her as the face of longevity. You probably know her better than you know Nier. And she is really the engine uh, behind the study. And without her, things wouldn't happen. And you probably all guessed who it is. <laughs> it's Wanda Guzman. So I want to ask Wanda to come up. And so we're presenting this award to Wanda Guzman in recognition of dedication, dedicated service to the longevity studies at the Institute for Aging Research. Thank you, it's my pleasure. <laughs> and with that, I will transfer the podium to Anna. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Nir. Does everybody hear me okay? Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Anna Bortnick. I'm from the Department of Cardiology at Einstein Montefiore. I'm an interventional cardiologist, which means that I take care of that one heart attack. <laughs> and um, as an interventional cardiologist, I got involved in this study, this line of, of research, because I was really struggling a lot clinically dealing with disease of hardening of the arteries and seeing people who are getting older and have any hardening of the arteries and being challenged to figure out how to open up those arteries, how to open up heart valves or replace heart valves. And this gets more difficult as we get older because we have more organ systems that have issues. Uh, so we have potential to have uh, a lot of challenges with treating our patients that are getting older. And I wanted to know really why are we having hardening of the arteries? And is there something we should be doing about this? And what can we do? So I started to interact with Sophia and Nir. And what I learned is that aging is not some sort of inevitable process, but may be manipulated, and we might be able to help people age more healthfully. And there might be people who have absence of heart disease, even at older ages. And I wanted to know more about that, and I started to work within the longevity study. So what is hardening of the, of the arteries? What is hardening of the heart? But this is a, uh, an artery of the heart. This is someone who already has had bypass. You can see the staples. And they're coming now with this very tight blockage and symptoms. Not only do they have this problem, but then they also have other medical problems, diabetes, kidney disease, all the things that Nir really talked about. And they come to me, and now I'm faced with challenges of opening up this blood vessel. Uh, and it's not so straightforward. So who gets hardening of the arteries? Who gets hardening of heart valves? Well, age is that overarching risk factor. Uh, men, uh, white race, uh, it's definitely genetic, but there are other contributors, other diseases that contribute, contribute and play into this. And some of these things we can manipulate and some of them we can't. I'm sorry for the men. I'm sorry if you have you know, the, the genes that are not favorable. But what we can do is maybe move people to be a little bit more like the people who age well and age healthfully. And that's where these lessons from genetics help us. How can we make people a little bit more like the healthy agers? So heart scans see calcium, and calcium predicts blockages in heart attack. So it's a very easy way to kind of assess your risk. So does it have meaning for someone who's older? We actually know a decent amount of information about heart calcium in younger individuals, you know, kind of in that 40 to 65 range, we have more information. But what about people who are above the age of 75? What about people in their 80s? What do we know about this? Well, actually, heart calcium does increase you know, risk of death, even as we get older. If you were a healthy ager and you scored a zero on this test, this is the test you want to have a zero on, because 
that actually is associated with, with better outcome for you. But it is associated with increased risk, even as we get older. So there are people who are aging healthfully, and there are people who are at increased risk with this hardening of the arteries. So how could the scan help you? You know, let's say I, I have a scan, and now what? I have hardening of the arteries. What am I supposed to do with this information? Well, the way that we might use that, if you came to me and I was your cardiologist, is I might say, well, your score is a zero, so how helpful is it for you to be on a cholesterol medicine now in your 70s and 80s as compared to if your score were above 100? So there's some information about that. And what we're understanding is that if you have a score of zero, I only need to treat about 200 of you to prevent one heart attack. But if you have a score of 100 or above 100, and you start to have that moderate calcif calcification, moderate hardening of the arteries, I really only need to treat about 20 people to, get, to prevent that one heart attack. So it starts to become more helpful. What about aspirin? A lot of controversy about, should I be on aspirin? Sometimes you hear yes, sometimes you hear no. If you have a score of zero, I have to treat about two auditoriums full to prevent the one heart attack, about 2,000 people. Well, this is a small auditorium, so maybe like four auditoriums. And then if you have a score above 100, I really only need to treat about 200 people before I have that prevention of the one heart attack. So it does help you kind of figure out how you might um, make decisions about your, your treatment with your doctor. That said, we're always gathering information. And I would say that in older individuals who are in their 70s and 80s, there's less known. So some of you might get a scan report back, and it will say, you're in the 96th percentile for age. Or, hey, good for you, you're in the 10th percentile. You know, you scored really well. You, you, lower is better. This test is, is lower is better. Some of you might get a report back, and it says, we can't give you a percentile because we don't have any information. That means that you are above the age of which there's information about. So above the age of 84, we know less. And that's where we can really make some uh, inroads into understanding things. Now, we also might have some surprise findings. And some of you have come and we've done scans and we've picked up on surprises. And that actually sometimes translates into benefit for you. We've picked up on some early stage cancer and we've had volunteers who we believe are cured from their cancer based on the surprise findings that we had in our study. And, um, and that's kind of amazing to have that, you know, that phone call or that feedback that says, hey, your study actually impacted me um, and may have saved my life. And that's a, a kind of an incredible moment for both me and for the volunteer when we both realized how amazing it was that, that maybe this study made a huge difference in their outcome. So why is hardening a problem? Well, I like to say that drills are not just for the dentist. An interventional cardiologist has to use drills to drill out calcium. Doesn't that sound terrifying that I could be drilling in your artery at 150,000 rotations a minute? And it sounds like you're at the dentist, like I'm drilling a cavity, but I'm drilling in your heart artery. And that has a lot of risk. So what I have on the left is this is the same person who had that bypass and had that terrible blockage. And there's a little black dot over there. There's a little tube, and then there's a black dot. The black dot is the drill. And I'm drilling all the way down. And you know, at the end, I'm able to actually open up the artery. And I'm actually able to restore all that blood flow. What other things do we do in my world that are highly terrifying related to calcium? <laughs> we also replace heart valves. Heart valves calcify as we age, and that blocks blood flow to the body. That creates a terminal illness whereby you have risk of heart failure and death. And when you get symptoms from this hardening of the heart valve, it needs to be replaced. But talk about doing a heart surgery at 50. That sounds like that might beat you up for a few weeks. But talk about doing a heart surgery at age 80 or 90, and you might not do well. You might not survive that surgery. So what we've developed are ways to do this in a minimally invasive fashion, where we put little tubes and wires in the heart, and we're able to actually fully replace the heart valve, and you go home the next day. 
So that's kind of the amazing progress that research has made, and that's happened within the past 10 years in our field. And it's only within the past six that that technology has been approved in the US. And this is what that valve looks like. It comes on a little balloon and it's kind of crimped down. And what we do is we put you in a temporary state of cardiac arrest and open up this heart valve inside the old one. We don't even take the old one out. We just push it out to the side and leave behind a new one. Mildly terrifying. And, and I'm seeing you at the end of this. So my question is, why, why are we coming to this mildly terrifying moment together? Couldn't we be doing something about this decades earlier to have avoided this problem? And what do we understand about it? And it turns out, you know, we're really just at the infancy of medical therapy. There is no medication that prevents this calcification. And that's unfortunate. So could it be prevented? Well, some have less heart attack as compared to others. The centenarians have, you know, 60% less heart disease than everybody else. So how do we become more like a centenarian? Well, longevity, 1,100 enrolled and counting, tell your friends. We're still looking for help and volunteers, people who are interested in this question. And what we're doing is we're getting those CAT scans and trying to compare people who are the um, descendants of centenarians and people who are not. And are there differences in the amount of hardening of the arteries and valves? And could we then link that back to the genetics and the proteins and other mechanisms, like how well you clean cholesterol out of your, your blood and out of your arteries? Maybe you're a better housekeeper, and you just clean up better, and so your arteries are pristine. Still in the process. If you decide to join our CAT scan study, what we do, you come and meet me at the Hutchinson Metro Center campus, which is one of our um, you know, new outpatient centers. It's, it's over here, kind of this direction. And um, I meet you here. It's like over there. <laughs> you know? and, then, and, then, and then we go into this beautiful scanner. And I wanted to show a picture because I really like this room. It's got a, I call it a, a view. I like to tell people you're going to see a surprise when you go into the room. And, and the surprise is that when you lay down, you actually see a beautiful picture of the sky. So I think from a volunteer and even patient perspective, it's really pleasant to be there. And I really enjoy going. I like the people. I like the environment there. And I really enjoy having breakfast with you because I have breakfast with the volunteers. And it's like, you know, you guys are so fascinating. I have three books I need to read. I get, not only do I recruit you for things, but guess what? My volunteers recruit me for things because you're, some of you are activists, you are uh, in the community, you're writers, you are thought leaders in your own areas, you're researchers, and you um, want to engage with me and tell me fascinating stories. I even dated one of my forms wrong because I was so wrapped up in the story that I was hearing that I didn't even get the date right. So in conclusion, Hardening of the arteries is common, it, but it doesn't appear to be inevitable for all people, and we don't understand this. The biologic causes of hardening the arteries are still under research. Treatments really only exist for late stage disease, and that's what I'm dealing with, and I'm very concerned about that because we have 20% of North America that's above the age of 65. We have 300,000 people worldwide getting valve replacements in the fashion that I just showed you. And I'm drilling more than I'd like to be. Uh, and, and it's mildly terrifying. So I, you know, let's do something about this problem. We're lacking prevention. We're lacking new medication. So we need to have better understanding of what's going on. And you're contributing to this better understanding. So I want to thank the Institute for Clinical Translational Research for funding our pilot study. We've enrolled 53 people out of 80. And we hope to expand one day to the entire longevity group and open it to everyone so they could benefit potentially in, un in understanding their calcium uh, uh, scores. And uh, I look forward to meeting more of you. Thank you. My first question is with, with Irving Kahn at 104 still working. What relationship does work, whether it be volunteer work or commercial work, have to do with longevity? Irving wanted to work. No, I mean, is, is there a correlation? Or that you but but I, I think you're, you're asking a good question that, that people are asking us all the time. You know, we're, we're predicting that health spend will be increasing. And 
And although there's longevity benefit, uh, what's going to be the changes in society? First of all, we'll have to consider to adjust retirement age or having second careers or careers that are, import that are important and helpful in your age. There's uh, questions about social security and uh, retirement funds and other things. The increase in health span is not on its own an economical program. It has to be um, uh, met with other things. And I'll tell you that in every level, we are discussing those issues with other people. I've been at the Senate and at the Congress and at the FDA, and those are discussions that are happening. I'll tell you one thing. It's not that uh, next year you'll be able to leave 20 years later, OK? It's going to be gradual. The changes are going to be relatively gradual. Uh, and when I say gradual, I'm, I'm, I'm talking few years, not, not decades. But it's going to happen in the next years, and it'll have to adjust itself. Well, let me rephrase it slightly. Did, do centurions retire at later ages than the average population? So are they more, are they more active? Do they volunteer more? Are they more socially active? And do they work uh, longer? I don't think that we have that information really. But, but I'll tell you anecdotally, and, and we, a lot of our centenarians are on television, most of the centenarians that we have, they're doing something else interesting. Uh, Debbie, um, uh, to mind comes the librarian, right, from the New York City Library, who's 101, or you, you know who I'm talking about? The one in the movie who's walking faster than the reporter in the library? So in other words, we have centenarians that are working. We have centenarians that are working. We have centenarians that are painting and selling paintings. My wife bought one for me. Uh, uh, they're, they're active. We have a, a surgeon who was a musician. So he, he was playing the violin in a, a quartet. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of centenarians that have actually been fully engaged with work, with hobbies, with communities. There was a study done at Harvard uh, a few years ago which compared all of the, um, all of the uh, longevity um, markers that you had from high cholesterol, and et cetera. But they showed at the top of that list that it was family and social interaction that predicted longevity aside, way beyond all of the other, you know, low salt diet or this and that. I did not see that in your list of uh, the parameters you're controlling for. Would you comment, please? So, so some of the parameters that we have looked uh, at in terms of personality and social interactions do suggest that centenarians overall have a more positive outlook on life and uh, are more socially engaged uh, just because of their person, the way their personalities are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what's interesting about that is you sometimes don't know, what, you know where's the chicken and where's the egg. You know, are these people more engaged and uh, have maybe better social structures because of their genes and these are, and also because they're doing well health-wise and so they're more able to go out and participate or is it the other way around that social participation or having social networks is contributing to longevity? If I can add, um, let's distinct, when you're reading the papers or any information and it says longevity, um, it's not necessarily representing you or your parents, okay? We are talking here about exceptional longevity, okay? So there's no doubt that social interaction is important in aging <laughs> and maybe contribute of why you would live above the age of 80 and not before, but remember that this study is different. We have exceptional longevity. And so I want to give you the best example. Although we found all this really great personality in centenarians, I want to tell you about this story. Um, 
There was a 102-year-old uh, gentleman, and I, I went to see him, and he is like the nicest guy I've ever met. You know, it was so agreeable and had nothing bad to say about his daughter-in-law or anybody else. Um, was just such a gentleman and so kind and nice. And so I walk out and I bump into his son, 82 years old, right? And, and I'm telling his son what I just told you. I, I think this is the nicest guy I've ever met. And the son looks at me and says, you should have seen the son of a bitch when he was my age. He was terrible. <laughs> so we think that personality doesn't change because people have checked personality until, I don't know, age 65. But think of centenarians. At the last years of their life, they start, things started happening to them, right? They're, they're widowers. Uh, they're moving to other places, maybe to other cities, they're moving next to their kids, they're changing. And so there are a lot of changes that makes them not the ideal people to look about in, at interaction anymore, you know? Uh, and still they have this nice personality. So the explanation for that, in, in my mind, is from another study that was done in University of Pennsylvania where they took young and older people and showed them lots of slides. And the slides were either like really nice, you know, islands in Hawaii, or really disgusting, like a pizza with cockroaches and things like that. And, and then they asked them to recall what they saw. And of course, the young people were able to recall much more than the old people, but the old people recalled more the good things, and not the bad things. I I'm looking forward to that, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, so it explains that some of the physiology of aging, some of the adaptation, and it might be in the brain, is to actually remember the good thing, and that's why the personality at 100 years old, we don't know. That's why we look at you and see where you will be. <laughs> and I don't see how you'll be nicer than you are now, but, but let's see. <laughs> I would like to ask the cardiologist about some other things going on. Um, many people are um, doing the ketogenic diet, and their diabetes tends to go away, and their blood levels change, whether it's, I think in some ways it's good, but it's different because the cholesterol can be higher. And I'm just wondering if you look into any of these things. Because from what I've been reading and what I've been doing, a lot of very good doctors are involved in the ketogenic diet to keep people healthier. And from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like it's all the same old stuff and the cholesterol and the hardening of the arteries and all that stuff. And changes are being made, and it doesn't sound like you're part of them. And I'm just wondering, why not? Well, that sounds like a challenge. That's what I said. And it is a challenge because what you're talking about is a pre prevention, prevention through lifestyle. And there's definitely a contribution to that, 100%. There have been some studies of diets that work. And um, there are a few things that have come out, Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, which is a, a higher calcium, low sodium diet, um, Weight Watchers, you know, helps with, you know, kind of reversing some of these uh, abnormalities with metabolism. And maybe at the end of the day, uh, there may be multiple ways to get to prevention. And a lot of those things that you're talking about will lower cholesterol or will lower weight or will lower diabetes, lower blood pressure. Uh, but that's, that's the most, one of the most important things that you can do. Those are the things you can really modify. The, like I said, the genetics, the fact that you're aging, the um, you know, male sex, some of this stuff is beyond your control. But what we try to do and what we try to tell our our patients is always, let's modify the things we have control over today. Of course, we're going to know more down the line. There are going to be more interesting therapies. There will be more interesting technologies. But uh, let's stop smoking. Let's start with the basics. Let's eat more vegetables. Let's eat more fruits. These are things that we definitely have, you know, can do, and that's within our control to do. 
So you're absolutely right. We do need to think about diet, and we do need to think about um, modifying diet. And so if somebody presented me with a calcium score and said, hey, what do I do with this information? Maybe one of the first things you say is, well, let's modify the diet. Let's look at what, you know, what you're eating and the things you can control, making sure your blood pressure is in line, making sure your sugar is good, and making sure your weight is reasonable. That's really the fundamental, you know, basic uh, foundation of the house. And then everything else is the, the window dressing, the aspirin, the cholesterol treatment, and those only go so far. And that's why we have new therapies coming out. You know, I'll just tell you briefly, the targets in cholesterol have changed a lot. You know, when you think about what the normal good cholesterol that you wanted to have like 30 years ago, they always said, well, you know, it's like below 200. Well, now that's, that's like, forget it. That's so high. You know, now we're targeting lower and lower. We're now more in this range where even below 70, you see benefits in terms of preventing second heart attack with people who've already had the first. So the numbers are moving and the data is changing. Maybe it's not changing at a pace we'd like it to. We want it to go faster. But, uh, but, but there's more information all the time. And, and things that they did in previous generations, we don't do anymore because we know better now. <laughs> so they'll laugh at us later. Would you be interested in having a grandchild come in whose parents are not both Ashkenazi? So yeah, thank, thank, thank you for asking that. So, so we're actually going to limit this uh, offspring study to grandchildren and children whose parents are all Ashkenazi. And the reason is because we need to maintain this genetic homogeneity that Nir had alluded to. Because if we start um, enrolling people of other genetic backgrounds and there is more admixture, that means we're going to have to recruit a lot more people and we're going to need a lot more resources to get to the answers that we need. And also because we're tr the goal of this uh, younger study is then to take the genes that we identify in centenarians or that we identify in you and then to test them out in the younger generation. Um, and again, because it's a group of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, it allows us to hone in on those genes much better. Uh, I, I want to say something in response to a question I got before and another phone call that I got. The woman said, you know, I'm, I'm married to a non-Jew and my son did his DNA and I'm really distressed from what he found in Ancestry.com. So what did he find? He found that he's 46%, only 46% Ashkenazi Jew. That means I'm only 92% Ashkenazi Jew. Well, guys, that's as good as it gets, okay? <laughs> there's no 100%. There's no it's a statistical evaluation. If you're 90% and above, you're an Ashkenazi, an Ashkenazi Jew, okay? Yes. Yes. I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. It's 97.3 percent Ashkenazi by 23 in me. You won. <laughs> uh, I'm married to a woman who's 97.3 percent Ashkenazi Jew. We have children. <laughs> uh, but what I was I wanted to address this to cardiology, uh, and it's a follow-up to the question that actually came before. I thought it was somewhat nihilistic to say that there is nothing that alters progressive calcification. There are certainly many. Uh, biologically plausible interventions, some of which have been studied with significant supportive evidence in addition to it. Uh, I don't know if you intend to follow them at all, but those interventions are being marketed sometimes along with a whole bunch of other interventions that have so no biological plausibility other than that they're profit making. But you ought to separate the two out. Uh, and indeed, there are biologically plausible interventions that are out there. I mean, all of the vitamin K dependent proteins that are involved with calcification come to mind. Yes. Thanks for bringing this up. So, you're, so the, the, the observation is well, wait a minute. Uh, why are we um, disturbed if we have a, a moderate or severe score? And, and there seems, is there something I can do about this? And right now, uh, where are we with this? 
So this, is, again, is an area that needs to be more explored. And one of the things you brought up were the vitamin K-dependent proteins. So actually, I have a study where we're looking at this. We're measuring it in um, uh, 2,600 volunteers from a different background, different study. It's a multi-ethnic study. And we're looking at whether or not some people have um, you know, very good uh, vitamin K metabolism that might be protecting them against uh, calcification. And there are some small studies where they're actually uh, giving back uh, vitamin K, and they're seeing potentially a decrease in the progression of calcium and hardening of the heart valves that I was just talking about. So the, this is in, in movement. The other thing that's happening is the genetic studies have taught us that a certain type of cholesterol is more of a risk factor for hardening of the heart valves. And there's some new medications coming up through Ionis, actually, which drop this level. Because right now, there's no tablet that really does that same job to the same effect. So it, it's underexplored, and it needs more, um, you know, me, more research in terms of what's preventing progression. And then can we regress some of it? Are there people who actually regress calcification? There are a few examples of this in the literature. There's some small reports of people who have, let's say, breast calcification on a mammogram where they've seen regression. Or there are some infusions that are given uh, for people who have diffuse calcium deposited in the tissues, usually related to kidney disease, where they give an infusion and they're able to kind of resolubilize this. Uh, so there are some examples, and we need to do more on the idea of can we then you know, put it back into solution? Or is it really a precipitant that sits there hard as a rock and I have to deal with it with the drill and with the heart valve replacement? Still more to come on this as well. Richard, your question better be irrelevant to everyone here. I hope so. Actually, Anna, everyone's picking on you, so I'll join the line. And as a follow-up to the comments this gentleman made, CT scans um, expose you to a fair amount of radiation. And if there's not going to be any follow-up, then why would one want to go through the testing? So the amount of exposure that you get is about the equivalent of living on Earth for, the, for four to six months. Uh, the, number, the amount of radiation x-ray that you get from the CAT scan has dropped a lot because of better machines, better technology. But there's still x-ray there. So it's considered an exposure to x-ray. Um, now, how would that gen change, let's say, your cancer risk? What's your likelihood of getting cancer from a one-time CAT scan? Um, you know, it's pretty minimal. It would probably be less than 1%. But the exposure is there, so you have to kind of put it into your own frame of mind. If you have a lot of exposure, repeated exposure, you know, I've had a lot of x-ray or I've had a lot of CAT scans or, or other scans, you have to think about it. But um, um, it's something that is about that equivalent of the four to six months of living on Earth. Oh. Well, so you get the report. So the report goes to the volunteers, and you have your calcium score, and you might know your percentile if you're below the age of 84, where there's some information to tell you that. And then it'll pick up on any other little finding or ditzels that it sees, right? So for some people, they've had direct benefit because we've picked up on lung, you know, lung, some lung cancers. Um, and uh, we've had two people, um, and red herrings, there are red herrings. So it might generate some testing that maybe you didn't, you know, maybe that ultrasound and maybe another repeat CAT scan. But so for some people, it's, it's created great benefit. For other people, um, uh, it's neutral. So it depends on how, how you perceive it and where, how you think it fits into the knowledge that you like to have about yourself and whether it might affect what you do. I know people come and they have different, sometimes they have different uh, reasons for coming. And people will say, I just want to show my doctor that my arteries are normal. <laughs> you know, they're really certain. And, and, it's, and it's interesting. And then, um, and then it generates a lot of phone calls and discussion. I have a lot of people call me back and they say, hey, I found this. Well, what do I do with this now? And we talk about it. And uh, I think for each person, it has a kind of a different meaning. And, and this is volunteering, okay? You get, the, you get you, your doctor get the result. The same is for the MRI. And, and uh, the risk-benefit ratio, you know, there's no really risk that's worth uh, discussing here. I'm sorry, I thought my phone is off. Um, and, um, and, and, and as Anna said, you know, sometimes you get the benefit just by finding something uh, incidental that helps. But 
we're, we're telling you what we're, do, what we're doing, what information there's up there, and absolutely, you have to decide if it's okay for you. Uh, we feel that the information is good. <laughs> and, and I want to add something. I'll, I'll let you in a second. I want to add something. You know, we cannot give you your genetic information. We have a lot of your genetic information. We cannot give you it because we're doing research, okay? Uh, this information is part of research. You are really unidentified as far as the statistics that we are going to do. If you're interested in genetics, and we, I might have said it to some of you, you should do 23andMe. Uh, 23andMe includes some of the longevity genes too. But you could do 23andMe because they have the right genotypes, the right risk, and the right information. We are doing only research here. So we cannot... They sell your information. Sorry? They sell your information. Well, uh, you, you, do, you, do, uh, you do whatever you want. I, I'm there. I, I don't know what they're doing. I really don't care what they do with this information. I want to have that. And I discovered some interesting things about myself that I had no, had no ID. So uh, this is another issue. I'm not defending anybody, but uh, for me, for me, it's it's fine. Please. Well, from a, from a, you know, there are many things that I hoped will come true, and they were true such as the increased health span, right, of centenarians. I think the most surprising finding scientifically was this growth hormone thing. And, and as I said, more than half of our centenarians have something that decreased their growth hormone activity. And it's not only interesting for me, but it means that people who are selling growth hormone as therapy for aging are really putting people at risk Okay, so it, it comes back to what's out there. There's a whole industry that's called anti-aging. And they're our enemy of us, the scientists, who are doing a science to look at aging and to target aging. And this is the short summary of anti-aging. A lot of the things out there in the web are, first of all, everything helps the economy. You spend money. So that's good. Second... Most of the things that you buy in the bottle, the substance that is there is not there, okay? There's really no good regulation on that. Sometimes it was there, but it's not stable, okay? But most of the things are not dangerous, are not there, so they're not dangerous. Oh, thanks God. Some of the things, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know, because in order to know, you need a clinical study, a controlled study, okay? And there are not a lot of them. So there are some things that in the bottle that might be good, and some of them will be bad, and we don't know. But growth hormone is the example of something that there is enough evidence to suggest that it's not good. It's a billion-dollar industry. Why is it working? Because it gets, um, it gets the skin smooth. It actually it takes fat from under the skin. So this, the skin is smooth. It, uh, the muscle bulge because there's less fat around them. <laughs> so you, you think you see the benefit. And if you die, nobody sues them. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think we have to be careful. And our job as scientists is to be responsible and to really make sure that we know what's out there and what's not. And thanks for asking that. Yes, last question. Are you talking on behalf of her, or how does it work? Thank you. First of all, thank you for the privilege of participating in this study. It's nice to know that our taxpayer money is being used so effectively. Um, I have a question about the cost benefits of the MRI. Is anybody studying what happens to the healthy brain when it is scanned with an MRI? Well, I guess it's an MRI scan. And would you include that in your study, those subjects who have, been, uh, have done the MRI part of it and those who have not? Is there a five or 10 year, perhaps, um, influence from that or effect from that? 
So I guess I will start with the second part of your question, and the answer is, sure, we can look at that. <laughs> but to answer the first part of your question, MRI is considered to be very safe. Uh, in fact, it is done on infants, it is done on babies, um, and it is you know, a well-studied technology uh, that has been shown not to be harmful. Um, and we're only doing, well, I guess two MRIs is our hope over the span of uh, four to five years. Uh, but you know, it is FDA approved and it has been shown not to cause uh, negative impact. Um, the CAT scans, you know, there is radiation exposure, there is some risk, although not significant, but with MRIs, we don't have that. Even pregnant women sometimes are allowed to have MRIs uh, if it is, you know, clinically indicated. Richard, that was really, that was a Galileo mo moment? In terms of benefits to being scanned. Um, not that we know of, but again, we'll be able to look at that in our participants who do participate and those who don't. We still don't have an aneurysm that we found by accident by MRI, so we don't have the same example. Richard, something really... Well, well, you know, I, 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 for me, this is not the problem how to get information. For me, the problem out there is how you read the information because people are so influenced by the marketing, okay? And for me, it's teaching people how to read the information. You can have a substance and you can say whatever there is about it, but if you don't see a clinical study, it's absolutely go to the next web page. Okay? I, I think this is the problem. The problem is that there is information. You just have to understand what is real scientific information and what is a hope or snake oil or something else. Uh, so, and, and you know, there's a lot of information out there and, and doctors are reading whatever information they can and they, they don't know anything. And, 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 you know, maybe you can do, you're an intelligent guy, you can do it on yourself sometimes and check it like that. Guys, uh, thank you very much, again, not only for coming here tonight, but from, for being with us. I hope that you uh, had some taste some flavor of what we're doing, and we're doing a lot, and we are making real progress all the way to drug uh, development. We're still recruiting. We have 1,100 people, but we would like to have 1,400 people in our studies. So if you know whether children of centenarians or their children of centenarians and their spouses or other neighbors who are Jewish, that you think could volunteer, we would love to have them here. And we obviously are always available and we want to communicate for, with you. And we're, we're grateful for this discussion that we have. So thank you very much. Ta take the rest of the food out there and enjoy the evening. Thank you.